Well, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see you today. Hello to anyone who's joining with us online today as well. Really is wonderful to gather, uh, to be able to worship together. You know, I was greatly encouraged this morning. I was sitting, standing next to Pastor Steve McCready, and he was singing about God's goodness at the top of his lungs in light of the Irish losing this morning and the rugby well done, Steve. Shows real maturity from you. But it really is, it's my privilege to get to welcome you along today, whether you're here for the first time or the first time in a long time. Um, it really is great to have you here, and I trust that you're doing well. It's, um, it's been a big few weeks, hey? A lot of significant things happening, and in light of that, I'm honestly so grateful that we have the opportunity to come together and to turn our attention towards the Prince of Peace, our Lord Jesus. And uh, if you are here with us for the first time, we're Riverview Church. We are a bunch of ordinary men and women, no offense, everyone, who have had our lives transformed by the good news about Jesus. And as per normal, we're gonna spend the next little while exploring the scriptures together. Uh, at the moment, we're in a series of sermons that we've titled Hallowed. Just turn to your neighbor and say, hello. hello. Yeah, hallowed, yeah, that's good. Hallowed, is that me you're looking for? <laughs> now we're exploring, right, the, the, the gift that Jesus gives to his disciples, the Lord's prayer. And you know, I can't think of a better time to echo the question of the disciples who say, Lord, teach us to pray. And so we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. It says, and when you pray, do not keep babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. And this morning we're gonna be spending a little bit of time sitting with the phrase, give us today our daily bread. Now, I don't know if you've realized this already, but it is like 70 days until Christmas. I don't know where the year has gone. Uh, maybe you've already seen the Christmas trees coming out at like Costco or Maya, depending on where you shop. But my wife, right, she's already getting into the Christmas season. It's, it's, a, it's a time, I'll tell you. She asked if we could put the Christmas tree up already. I said no. So now she's just singing Christmas carols around the house already. It's enough to drive me a little crazy. Uh, and you know what happens? My wife sings and then my little son kind of starts echoing them around the house. So it's like uh, stereo sound. And in the last three weeks, I've received email after email after email from Elfster, which is like a, an app that my family used for Christmas lists. And it's been notifying me that people have been adding to their Christmas lists already. And on top of that, I have this, this little son who is walking around the house letting me know day after day what he wants for Christmas. He's telling me that he wants a, a Spider-Man cricket bat. I don't think they exist. A bluey watch, some soccer gum boots, among many other things. Now, I don't know what, what you want for Christmas this year. I don't know what's on your Christmas list. But here's something I've discovered about pretty much every human being. We all want. Almost every person here has things that they desire for or look forward to or are hoping for. Now, not only do we want, but the reality of human experiences is that we all need. We have needs. Now, on the list of things that we truly need, the things that we truly need isn't actually that long, right? However, sometimes the, the lines between need and wants get a little bit blurred, and you've probably seen this with your children. I need this thing. No, you don't really need it. Like you don't need a 75 inch TV on your wall when you have a perfectly good 65 inch TV sitting on your wall, right? It might be nice, but you don't really need it. But in saying that, I know that in this room, right, there are many needs that are represented, wants or needs that are represented in this community. I know there's many people in this room who are really hoping and longing just for a holiday. The opportunity to rest and to take time to be with family. I know many people in this room are longing and wanting healing and restoration, whether that's healing in your body or restoration in a relationship. 
I know there's many people who long for a pay rise, who want a pay rise. Can you say amen today? (laughs) You know, the, the cost of living has increased and pressure has increased. And I know so many people would just love a little bit more breathing room. But the reality is most of us are not praying for literal daily bread, right? But rather, we're the kind of people that are praying for a new kitchen in which we can make our daily toast. And so to want and to need is to, be, you know, is to be human. It's part of who we are. It's only humans that desire for that which is not. And these needs and these wants aren't actually bad. They're just part of being human. Now, if you've been to university, I would imagine on week one, you probably would have been introduced to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Just give me a wave if you've seen this before. Yeah, Abraham Maslow, he's an American psychologist uh, in the mid 20th century. He introduced us to this kind of pyramid of, of human needs. On the, on the base level of need is physiological needs, you know, food, water, clothing, etc. And above that level is our need for security and for safety, whether that's, you know, protection or stability or income. And as you work your way up the triangle, the higher up you go, the less fundamental the needs become. Like you don't find someone who is desperate for physiological needs, worrying about self-actualization. Now, when you look at a diagram like this, you're kind of reminded fairly quickly uh, that we can actually survive on very little. We don't have that much that we really, really need. Like we need shelter, but we don't necessarily need a five-star hotel. Humans are resilient. We're pretty flexible creatures. Now, here's the other thing. Whilst Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs is helpful and provides us with a little bit of a framework, in some senses, it doesn't quite capture the full scope of human need. Because when self-actualization finds itself as the highest point of human need, we have a pretty big problem. Because in places like Perth, right, we are so incredibly blessed to have most of our needs met and fulfilled. And here's what we discover. Even when we have all of our needs met, we eventually realize that they don't really satisfy. You know, it's in the most privileged of places, places like Australia and the UK and the United States that depression and anxiety and loneliness run rife. And even when all of our basic needs are met, we still seem to be dying of thirst. We have an abundance of literal water, yet as societies and as cultures, we are dehydrated and in desperate need of living water. And the question I want to explore this morning is not what does Maslow have to say about our needs, but what does God have to say about our needs? What does the Word captured for us in the Scriptures, but revealed to us most clearly in Jesus, have to say about our needs and the things that we long for. Now, to start our time this morning, we read from Matthew chapter six, the Lord's Prayer. And of course, Matthew chapter six is part of Jesus's famous Sermon on the Mount in which he has a whole lot to say about need. And if you have your Bible with you, I'm gonna encourage you to turn there to Matthew six. And if you were just to read through the entirety of this chapter, you would discover a few things very quickly. And I've kind of done some of the work here, and I want to provide you a bit of a snapshot as to Jesus's teaching on need in Matthew chapter 6. Here's five things. Number one, our Father knows what we need. The Scriptures encourage us, don't babble on. You don't need to use many words. God already knows what you need, and that should be greatly encouraging to us. Number two, we are to ask Him for what we need. So even though he already knows what we need, we are to be the people who pray, give us today our daily bread. Now why ask the Father if he already knows? Well, that's a paradox that we'll pick up a little bit later on. Number three, do not worry about what you need. Once you've asked, we need not worry for God is a good Father. Number four, who cares for us? Not only does he know what we need, he cares for us. And thus, number five, God is faithful to meet our need. Verse 33 of Matthew chapter six, you may know this. It it says, seek first the kingdom. 
or seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Now this final point, number five, God is faithful to meet our needs, is 100% true and 100% complicated. It's like how a towel gets more wet as it dries, right? Like 100% true, yet 100% complicated. And I know many in this room would testify that God is faithful to meet our needs. But we know this this is not some cliche to kind of be bandied around because sometimes God meets our needs far differently to how we anticipate it. The Psalms remind us to wait patiently on the Lord and many will know that that sometimes is a lot of waiting. And sometimes God doesn't do things as we assume. You know, we were praying for healing, yet he met our need for peace and for strength. Or God didn't, you know, fix the job we were in, but he opened up a door for a new and a better job opportunity. All that to say, God is faithful and he is sometimes confusing. God is faithful, but he's painting on a a far bigger and greater canvas than we can comprehend. Now, there is a whole lot more to be said about unanswered prayer and God's faithfulness. In fact, the team at 24-7 Prayer have dedicated an entire course to these particular questions. It's called the Prayer Course to Unanswered Prayer. And uh, you can access this for free uh, through Right Now Media. And I would highly recommend this as a resource if or when you are sitting in the tension of God's faithfulness and unanswered prayer. Now, for the people of God, the people in, in the Scriptures... God being faithful to meet their needs was also really complicated. It was, you know, a key part of their story. In fact, the moment that Jesus prayed for daily bread, I have no doubts that there would have been many Jewish people that this would have evoked particular memories, a particular story of God's faithfulness. You know, the line daily bread was like a nostalgic smell. I'm sure you've had that before, right? Where you catch a whiff of something, you walk past somewhere, you smell something, and it just transports you back to a time in your childhood or to earlier things. Like my nephews love playing Pokemon cards. And every time, this is really random, every time I smell Pokemon cards, it takes me back to 2003, being in the US on a family trip, being at the Grand Canyon, eating Cinnabons and playing my Game Boy Color. I know that's really random, I don't know how it works, but you have those things that take you back to an earlier experience. And this is exactly what would have happened for the the Jewish people when Jesus instructed them to pray for daily bread. They would have immediately be transported back into the wilderness just outside Egypt. Many of you will know the story. This was their kind of independence day, their journey to becoming a people. God in his power sets the Israelites free from captivity in Egypt. He kind of parts the seas. They walk through on dry land. It's amazing. God is the provider. He is the liberator. And yet just a month into their newfound freedom, we read this in verse 2 of Exodus 16. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Now let's not judge their grumbling because I know you've had this happen when you're hangry too, right? Like you snap or you respond in a way that is totally not you and only because you haven't eaten lunch yet, right? This this happens And the people have just experienced God's incredible faithfulness, his care for them, but they've already forgotten. And so God steps in and he shows them that he is the Lord who is faithful to complete that what he began. That he hasn't led them out of Egypt so that they can die of starvation, but he is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Reading from verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, I've heard the grumbling of the Israelites, Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, hallelujah. And in the morning, you'll be filled with bread. And then you will know, I am the Lord, your God. That evening, quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? 
for they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who had gathered much did not have too much. And the one who had gathered little didn't have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. I love that. Not too much, not too little, just right. And You know, this story is, is nice, but it doesn't quite capture the, the full story because the people of Israel are human, you know, just like you and me. And so even though God instructs them just to collect enough manna for today, you know, you know what happens. They think, well, why just collect enough for today? Why not start collecting a little bit extra for tomorrow as well, just in case we run out? Now, I'm, I'm the youngest in a family with three boys, and so I feel like I kind of know this experience that the people of Israel went through. Because every second Saturday, we would spend some time with my grandparents, my dad's mum and dad. And on the menu every Saturday was scones with cram and uh, g- jam and cream. <laughs> cram <laughs> with cram. And then later on, we'd have like a roast, we'd sit around, and, and boy, oh boy, we were like chunky monkeys sitting around a table just devouring these things. She would make like a batch of 18, and between the three of us, we would just get through them. And as the youngest kid, right, I started to realize something that I could do. I could fit a scone in my pocket. I mean, what, what is a pocket if it's not a perfect scone carrying device, right? It's like perfect size. And because I was worried that my older brothers would eat more than I would, I'd start pocketing these things. And I'd think to myself, well, either I can have it later, I can save it for myself, or I can have it for afternoon tea. Now, trying to get the cream and the jam in your pocket, that's not a a very good time. (laughs) Nevertheless, I feel like I knew what this experience was like because I was worried that I wasn't going to have enough. And you know, the Israelites, they were instructed to collect only today's bread. Not tomorrow, not for the week ahead. And the lesson ought to be that if God cares for you today, then surely he will provide for us every day of our lives. And so it's in the wilderness with the manna from heaven that the Lord taught his people some valuable lessons. None more prevalent than the reminder that they were to depend upon the provider, not the provision. In other words, we are to trust our Father in heaven, not trust in the things that he provides. We're invited to trust in the bread of life, not in the physical bread that we receive. You see, the provision is but a signpost to a greater reality that we have a caring heavenly father who knows what we need and is faithful to meet our needs. And so we're encouraged to kind of stay near to the Lord, to trust him for today and then to trust him again tomorrow not to kind of take matters into our own hands and start hoarding up for the the winter, but to remind ourselves that we trust in the one who does not spoil or fade or run out. You see, bread and wealth and power, fame, all spoil and fade. But Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides, will never fade away. In fact, his faithful love endures forever. Jesus speaks of himself as this living water, as the bread that doesn't spoil or fade, but as bread that satisfies. In John chapter six, so they asked him, what sign will you give that we may believe, uh, see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it's my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Friends, the thirst that our world experiences is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not only the one who provides us 
with daily bread, but he himself is the bread of life. He's the one who sustains us. He is our source. He is our hope. In him, all of our longings, all of our wants, all of our needs find their ultimate fulfillment. You see, God's faithful to meet our needs. And it's to this faithful heavenly Father we are invited to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Now, it's at this point I wanna kind of pause and just sit in the tension of the Father who knows what we need and yet invites us to ask him, to pray and ask him for the things that we need. Like, how does that work? Is, is God just incredibly forgetful and he kind of, you take a ticket number, you mention your order, and then later you need to come back and mention it again? Like, what's going on here? Well, there's, there's a story found in the, in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 10 about a man referred to as Blind Bartimaeus. It's a curious story, an account that I think raises this, this question again. Jesus is on his ministry tour through Jericho and there's these large crowds and there's this blind man who's making lots of noise. He's causing a bit of a ruckus. He's crying out to Jesus. And, and much to the surprise of the crowds and the disciples, Jesus stops and he responds to this man. Mark 10 verse 48, it says, Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I wanna see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus along the road. Now, I, I think Jesus is amazing, right? I think he is so compelling. But in this story, I don't think it's his most attentive of moments because there's this particular blind man who's been waiting out the, on the side of the road and the, the scriptures clarify us for us the context that they are all, all aware that he's blind. And Jesus was aware that he is blind and he gets up to the front of the queue, the blind man's there ready and Jesus says, so what do you want me to do for you? Come on, Captain Obvious. Jesus, surely it's clear he wants to receive sight. And of course, this man articulates that. He says, Rabbi, yes, I, I wanna see. Now, it's interesting to me. I wonder if what is happening here is the exact same tension of the Father who knows what we need, yet encourages us to ask and to articulate what we need. So, so what's going on here? Well, I wanna share with you just two thoughts about maybe why God who knows what we need but encourages us to ask and to pray. Two suggestions in response to that question. Number one, why does the God who knows what we need encourages us to ask? Because it is good for us. You know, as I've journeyed with, with God, I've come to realize that our Fa Heavenly Father knows what is good for us. And I'm sure many of you in this room would, would know. You know, when he commands us to forgive uh, those who sin against us, it's because he knows what's good for us and for our world. And in the same way, when Jesus instructs us to ask for daily bread, I think he does so because he knows it's good for us. Now, why is it, why is it good for us? What, I just wanna suggest three things that I think is why this is good for us. Firstly, because it, it humbles us. When we ask God for what we need, we are reminded that we are not the masters of our own destiny. We are creatures that depend on the mercy of God. You know, as Steve said in week one of this series, prayer is the safe place that we can feel as small as we really are and recognize how big God really is. You know, asking God for daily bread is a conscious act of humility. Now, on the other side of this is, is false humility. And right, I am very guilty of this. Like, I often get to the place in my journey where I am oh so holy that I don't have needs anymore. Or I've just convinced myself that I'm so in control that I don't have any needs from God. I don't need his provision anymore because I've got it all sorted, God. But you know, God wants us to ask. 
even if we have the capacity within arm's reach to reach our provision without him. You see, it's asking that opens up the lines of conversation and communion. Asking God actually allows him to speak into our situations, to say yes, to say no, to say otherwise. Uh, my colleague and partner in crime, Reese Mayshell, has a very standard coffee order. Very standard coffee order. He gets a long black with a dash of cold milk. If you want to get him a coffee after the service, now you know. And so often, you know, around the office, we'll shout each other coffees. He'll cover me, I'll cover him. And I'm familiar with his coffee order, but I still try to make the effort to ask him each time what he wants. Because I think one day, <laughs> one day, he's going to get inspired and he'll order like an almond milk mocha or something like that. And so I want him to to still ask, I wanna give him the power of veto to suggest otherwise. You see, when we actually don't even ask God for daily bread, for the bread that we might have convinced ourselves that we've collected without him, we actually don't give him the opportunity to speak into the decisions of our lives. We rob him of the chance to veto, to direct us elsewhere, or even just to encourage us. I mean, what might it look like for us to talk with God about the daily necessities, the things that you've convinced yourself you don't need him for? To give our heavenly father space to direct us. And you know what? Giving over the highest power of decision and direction to God is truly humbling. Second reason it's good for us is because it builds our faith. When we ask God for things and we see him meet that need, it strengthens our faith like nothing else would. You know, asking God for daily bread is an act of faith, but it's also an act of strengthening faith. And like any, any relationship, right, it's through conversation and connection, through interaction that trust is built. You see, God's desire is to know us. It's for the conversation and connection with us. You know, he's not some genie in a bottle that you rub the lamp and he comes out and does what you say and then goes back into the lamp. No, he wants to be with us. And so often it's as we ask God for our need, we recognize our need for something even greater for him, for the peace that he brings, for hope, for faith. It's actually through our physiological needs that we are drawn back into relationship with our provider. And thirdly, it's good for us because it produces gratitude. You know, when we ask God for daily bread, we're reminded that he is not only the one who will provide for us, but already has provided for us. You know, I really sense that it's the people who pray for daily bread. They're the people who really appreciate daily bread. It's the people who have been looking for a rental for months and months and months. They're the ones that are filled with gratitude when they find something that's perfect not the person who gets their application accepted after the first time. You know, it's the same way, the people who actually ask God for daily bread are the ones who attribute credit to him when he provides. You know, if you don't ask for it, you're probably not gonna attribute credit for it, you'll think you earned it yourself. And you know what, how many of us know that he should get credit for all that we have? You know, Christians ought to be the most grateful people on the planet because we believe that all we have received is a gift from God and it's the kindness of our heavenly Father. Second point, why does the God who knows what we need, why does he ask us and invite us to, to ask and to pray? Second thought is because it's not always about me. You know, the language of the Lord's Prayer is not individualistic. The opening line, Jesus brings his disciples in and he, he's gonna teach them how to pray. What's the first word? Our Father in heaven. Jesus doesn't bring his disciples in and say, hey boys, let's pray. My Father in heaven, this is about me. No, our Father. There is something communal about this prayer and you'll notice in verse 11, it's the same. Give us, this day, our daily bread. This prayer is not about me getting mine, but it is about us receiving ours. Jesus is teaching us to be people who love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Last week, Megan reminded us that the Lord's Prayer is 
not about resignation, but it is about participation. It's through this prayer that we're invited to become kind of conduits of the, the kingdom of God, the kingdom that is aligned with the will of heaven. And so as we learn to pray, we are encouraged and taught to pray for the daily bread of our communities and our neighbours. And you know what? It's actually as we pray that we begin to become attentive and aware of how we might actually practically meet some of those needs. Now, you see, the way that God normally provides for his people is through his people. Like, I don't know about you, but I have very rarely received a freshly cooked meal from the Archangel Gabriel, like dropping it off at my doorstep. I have never received financial support when I've needed it most from the bank of God. You know, the provision that comes from heaven is delivered through the body of Christ, which is his people. I'll say that again. The provision that comes from heaven is delivered through the body of Christ, which is his people who are in line with his will. You see, I have needs. I have things that I want. I have things that I'm praying for. I have pressures. But Jesus is reminding us so does the person sitting next to you. And the way that we live out Shema is by praying to the Father, not just for my daily bread, but for yours too. And you know, this is where it gets practical, right? Because suppose I have two loaves of bread, metaphorically speaking, and I walk past someone who has no loaves of bread and is in need. I cannot walk past and do nothing if I have just prayed, give us this day our daily bread. Like I'm led towards generosity. I'm led towards the heart of our Father in heaven. See, praying for daily bread is a commitment to burden bearing, to walking together, to carrying together. And Jesus invites us to ask our Father for daily bread because it is good for us and it's not always about us. So friends, as we learn to pray, give us this day our daily bread. May we discover the generosity and the kindness of our Father in heaven. May we discover the richness of the community of God's kingdom. And may we discover the hope, the hope that springs forth because we are beloved children of Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Can you say amen this morning? We're well, gonna invite Josh and Andy to come and join me on stage. And in a moment, we're gonna respond through prayer and in song. But before we do that, I wanted to just read one last piece of, of scripture. And this is from the end of Matthew chapter six. And I really trust that this passage is gonna encourage us, us, encourage us this morning to uplift you, to remind you of the posture of those who are loved and cared by uh, cared for by our heavenly Father. This is from verse 25 of Matthew chapter six. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow, they do not labor and spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass, grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow thrown into the fire. Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be given to you as well. 
Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Can I invite you to stand this morning? You know, I'm, I'm not someone who regularly stops to smell the roses. I'm, uh, if you know like personality types, I'm a seven on the Enneagram. I am an ENFP, which pretty much, pretty much means I'm like a golden retriever puppy, just like excited, moving on to the next thing, on to the next thing. I'm, I'm not very reflective. I'm not very sentimental. Uh, I'm not very introspective. But this last week I was out in the park, just going on a short prayer walk and I stopped to smell the roses. And I watched the birds. Now, if you're wondering what a pastor does during the week, just go out and watch birds, yeah. I stopped to watch the birds. And this passage of Scripture came alive to me in a new way. Because the trees and the birds, they're beautiful, man. And God wants to remind each and every one of us, look at how He cares for them. And if He cares for them and loves all His creation, think of how much more He cares for you and for me. Take heart today, God loves you. God knows what you need. And not only does He know what you need, but He is faithful to meet you in your need at just the right time, in just the right way, time after time after time. You know, I recognise today that each of us comes this morning with needs. We have things that we're praying for, that we're hoping for, that we're longing for. And so I thought this morning what we'd do is just create space for us to pray for those needs. But as we've discussed this morning, this prayer for daily bread is not just about me and my needs. So what we're gonna do first is just create space to pray for the needs that exist in this community. And then we'll get to our needs. Is that okay? So can I invite you just to bow your head and to close your eyes. We're gonna just take time to pray for the, the needs that exist here in this community. So Heavenly Father, we come to you in the Wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So grateful that you see us, you know us, you love us, and that you're faithful to meet us in our need. And so Lord, we hallow your name. We exalt you on high. We recognise you as Lord of all. We pray for the establishment of your kingdom here among us. And we recognise the needs that exist. And so Lord, we pray for those who are in need of physiological things, for food, for shelter. We pray for those who are struggling with homelessness. Lord, we pray for those in our community who it's that second rung, the security. Lord, they need an income. They need stability, they need protection. Lord, we pray for those people. Would you be faithful to meet them in their needs? Lord, we pray for many of us who are experiencing the pressures of cost of living and we're not quite sure how we're gonna make it work. Lord, we pray for your mercy, your hand of provision over every person that's feeling that. Lord, we pray for those who are in need of visas those who long to be in this country, but paper might tell them otherwise, Lord, you are the God who provides. And so would you meet us in our need? God, we pray for those who are longing for children. We pray for those who are longing for a partner. These are desires in people's hearts. And Lord, we pray that you would meet them in those desires, in those longings. Lord, for those who have heartache over their own children or their marriage or relationships that exist, Lord, we pray in our need, would you meet us? Lord, for those who are longing for purpose, 
direction, for meaning. Oh Jesus, our bread of life, would you provide that for them? Meaning and purpose. Lord, for those who are battling with health, who have received diagnoses that are so difficult to hear, we stand on the truth that you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. For those who are wrestling with mental health, with anxiety, with fears, with insecurity. Lord, You know our hearts, You know our longings to be free, to be the kind of people who do not worry about our lives. And so we bring before You all the needs that exist in this community, the many needs that even I haven't been able to to pray for. We thank You that You see them, You know them, you are faithful, God. Love to just encourage you just to stretch your hands out before God. In your hands, just hold the need that you have. Because whilst we've prayed for many needs, I know that every person here does walk in with something that they're praying for. And so, Heavenly Father, we. We love you. And we've experienced your faithfulness before. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to hold the needs that we have and to place our trust afresh in you. Lord Jesus, we know who you are. We know what you're like. And we're filled with hope because of that but yet we have these things in front of us. So would you help us to hold them well? Would you help us to come back to you time and time again, our provider? And Lord, I pray that the very needs that we hold in front of us would draw us back towards you. Our need for bread, Lord, would it bring us back to the bread of life? Our need for provision, Lord, would it bring us back to you, our provider? And Lord, as we do, would we recognise that ultimately all we need is You. You are the one who meets all that we need. And so we declare this morning, we declare afresh that all we need is You.
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours, Lord, is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. It's in Jesus' name we say, Amen. Amen. Well, hey, thank you for being with us this morning. We wanted to just open up the altar down the front. There are a team of pastors and prayer team that would love to pray with you. If you're still holding something that you need, feel free to come on forward and we would love to pray with you. Thanks so much for being with us. We look forward to seeing you again next Sunday. God bless everyone.